Uh, let me take the discussion further and deepen it and talk to uh, Dr. Lavinia because you were there at the heart of COP21. How, how contentious was it? I mean, I was reporting on the side. I was here in Manila and an 11th hour banging of the gavel. What was the feeling like? Just give us a view just very quickly before you start your presentation. It was, it was very intense. I mean, it's, uh, these negotiations, it's not just the Paris, but e every climate change negotiations are 20 hour days, uh, 12 uh, days in a row. And in Paris, we extended another day. Uh, and on the last four days, we were, we were sleeping at 4 or 5 in the morning, back to the conference at 9 or 10 in the morning. So you can imagine when uh, the president of the COP, Minister Laurent Favius of uh, France, announced that the Paris Agreement was adopted after six years of intensive uh, negotiations. There was actually jubilation. Um, you could have seen it, I don't know if Secretary Mani de Guzman is already here, Secretary Mani de Guzman, um, Secretary Narika Costa, and diplomat Angela Ponza, we were in the Philippine desk, I was sort of the technical advisor to them, and we were actually jumping up and down and embracing each other. We did. And not we, just because of the agreement, but because, because we actually thought it was a good agreement. Good agreement for the Philippines? For the Philippines, it's a good agreement. I think for the world, um, it's a good um, uh, agreement. It's not perfect. Um, but fortunately, within the agreement, our mechanisms to improve it continuously. So even if it's an imperfect agreement, it's something uh, worth starting with. Well, tell us more about that through the presentation of your slides. You have seven minutes. Tell us how relevant that is to the Philippines. Mm. What was agreed at COP21? Sure. Uh, and I, I start with, with, with that, I mean, uh, with that uh, uh, scene. Where uh, were you in that picture? On December 12, where we at? we're in front. Okay, <laughs> you were jumping up and down, <laughs> we're like you were saying. <laughs> uh, of that, uh, of that, I mean, I'll, I'll show the picture of the Philippine delegation in, 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 in a while, I mean, uh, this, this is an important agreement for, for the world, very important for, for Asia Pacific, very important for the Philippines, uh, as, as David, I think, pointed out um, earlier. Uh, uh, you know, the, the climate system is, is in havoc. You know, I mean, the February figures are astonishing. Uh, we fought very hard for a 1.5 degree uh, cap because we think one, two degrees is too, too, uh, too high already. But uh, in February, just for that month, we know it's just a month, we nearly topped two degrees. Now it's quite, quite amazing. Um, what, what's happening. So we really need to have a global agreement. And it has to be a global agreement because if you don't have a, a global agreement that includes developed, developing countries, the biggest emitters to the smallest uh, emitters, then you won't be able to really um, solve the problem. That's the Philippine delegation. I mean, uh, um, composed of both very senior ones. Like, I've been into this for 25 years. I did my PhD on on climate change, when the climate change in Yale University in the States, when climate change was being negotiated for the first time in the United Nations in New York. Uh, and the Philippine government, it was then UP, then as a law professor, they actually asked me to go to New York to, to help uh, the government since I was the only expert in the field. So for 25 years, I've been, been, been doing this. And there are also very young uh, uh, colleagues there who are there for the first time, both from the government, uh, from all the different uh, agencies, and also from the private sector, and also from, uh, from NGOs. So it's, a, it's quite a, a, a really a good, good group of people. President Aquino gave us very good instructions and showed a lot of moral leadership and courage, at least on, on this issue. Um, we went to Paris with a very uh, strong commitment of 70% reduction of business as usual emissions. Um, which if you actually translate that uh, you know, into today's terms from the best that I can see, given that we are a land use, we are net sink right now in the Philippines because of our forests and land uh, and not very high uh, uh, carbon emissions, that's actually a 10% reduction of current emissions by 2030. It's still high because we are expected to grow our emissions from, from today in, to the next 10 years, I suppose, until we, we reach a peak. Um, but it's doable. And it's equivalent to what other countries in the region are actually doing, which is a range of 10 to 20 percent um, reduction of emissions. So it's, it's, not, it's not that big, but it's also uh, uh, high enough, uh, and it's uh, uh, doable. But in Paris, we focus on trying to get as, uh, as um, strong an agreement as possible. Uh, and so, uh, 
we, you know, lo knowing that we are a vulnerable country, we push very hard for a 1.5 uh, degree. I mean, which people said it's impossible. People, you only can do two degrees. Uh, we got that, but only half of it because we got it as an aspirational target in the Paris Agreement, not a mandatory target. The mandatory target is 2.0 um, uh, degrees. In Paris, we also fought very hard, and that I'm very proud of, uh, for human rights language and for ecosystems integrity language. You know, uh, in the 25 years I've been teaching this, advocating this, working on this both in government and outside of government, uh, the most difficult part about climate change is that it's so abstract. Until the storms hit us and people died, it was just so abstract for people. I mean, uh, those are really nice, you know, uh, uh, of, of what uh, carbon looks like, you know, visually. But people don't see that in their, uh, in their everyday, right? So uh, we have to make climate change a people problem and a nature problem, Pe people see. You know? And so having language and human rights and ecosystems is really, really very good. And the Paris Agreement is quite good um, about that. The Paris Agreement is also good in two respects you know, for the future. Uh, as I said, it's an imperfect agreement. It's not adequate at all to solve the problem. We're still on track for a three degrees increase uh, in global temperature, which is catastrophic uh, 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 for us. Um, but it has a self-correcting mechanism. We can actually increase ambition every five years. The first chance is to do it in 2025, 20, and no one can backtrack. The Philippines can, can never go back unless, of course, we want to be embarrassed and you know, legally uh, 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 challenged. Um, we can never go back and say, no, we will only reduce less than 70% of what we committed, assuming we ratify the, the, the commitment. Nobody's allowed to backtrack from their Paris uh, obligation. So we can only increase ambition. And we have to do that every five years uh, is, is what we agreed on. Secondly, it has a very good um, what you call loss and damage mechanism. We actually created in Paris uh, a mechanism by which countries like us who suffer loss and damage because of climate change, we can actually go back uh, to an international mechanism and ask for compensation for us some kind of support, a financial support, every time we suffer loss and damage because of uh, climate change. So the implications for Asia and the Pacific is actually huge if this is implemented properly. So moving forward, and just to connect it to the, the last presentation, I think it's very important for us to hold ourselves accountable to what we do. For the Philippines, uh, and it's actually true for all of Asia and Pacific because all our countries here, thankfully, actually went to Paris with strong commitments. Um, we have to hold ourselves accountable for what we uh, have committed uh, ourselves. In the Philippines, it's not just about energy. Energy is a big thing. I actually think we need new laws mandating a more diverse energy mix. I mean, the DOE can actually do it on their own, but it would be better if it's actually cast in stone so that in the next 25 years, we really commit mandatorily to an energy mix that's, that's more, more diverse and less, less carbon oriented. But it's not just energy, it's transportation in the Philippines, it's forest in the Philippines, very big. Uh, because without forest, that 70% is huge, it's impossible. But with forests, it's doable. So we have to fix our, our work on forests, make sure we don't lose any more forests uh, in the Philippines. And of course, the private sector for innovation, families, individuals, communities uh, must also reduce their emissions if you are able to address climate change.